Next on how we roll is torque from gravity. And by that, we really just mean we're going to roll things down an inclined plane. So here is a cylinder, and there it goes down the plane. We know that the source of the motion is a gravitational force. But let's describe it mathematically. So there is the ramp at some angle theta. And here is the cross section of the cylinder. Now we want to describe how fast it goes down the ramp. Well, we go straight to Newton's second law for rotations. Torque equals I alpha. And we're looking for alpha, the acceleration down the ramp. So let's see, torque. Let's think, what are all the forces that might be causing a torque on this thing? Well, let's see, we know there's mg, which always acts at the center of mass. So mg is pulling it straight down. It doesn't fall through, it doesn't fall into the surface. So if we did a whole uh, uh, Newton's second law, some of the forces we would find there's a, that there's a normal force right there. So hopefully it'll just accept that, yes, a normal force balances this component of mg. And we're going to talk about it later, but right now I'm just going to tell you there's a friction force back, a static friction force, because the contact point between the cylinder and the ramp isn't moving. That's a case of static friction. So I'll write this F. S. Those are the three forces. Now, which ones create a torque? We've got to remember that torque is R cross F, where R is the vector from the axis of rotation to the point the force is applied. So to calculate a torque, you've got to define an axis of rotation. We're going to describe this around the rotation axis around which it is actually rotating. The wheel, as we've talked about, is actually rotating about that point. Right, where the edge or the, where the edge of the cylinder touches the ramp. So if we look at these three forces, we see that the normal force creates no torque because R is zero. Right, the, the R vector from the axis to the place the force is applied has no length, so that's zero. So no torque from the normal force. Friction force, same thing. The R vector from the axis to where the force is applied is zero, nothing. And then finally, there's mg. And now you can see, now there's going to be a torque. We've applied a force here at the center, but our axis is over here at the edge. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, we've got to get a component down the ramp, but you don't really, right? Because if it's r across f, we can just write those vectors. So here's the vector r like that. It is uh, r from the axis to the center of the disk. And f is just the mg straight down. So we can do that cross product. We don't have to break anything into components. Let's see. So um, R cross F then is big R. Okay, I'll say this thing has, you know, mass M, I forgot to say, and radius R. So the, that cross product is the magnitude of the, of the radius or the dis displacement vector, big R, times the magnitude of the force, mg, times the sine of the angle between them. But since it's a cross product, it's a sine in the sense of tail to tail, right? So from, so if we write, there's R and there's MG. So it's this angle right here, all right? So if we do a bunch of triangles, we realize, well, that's actually theta, but it's the sine of 180 minus theta. And the sine of 180 minus theta is the sine of theta. So it still works out that it's the sine of theta, which is the same thing you'd get if you considered this a component you know, mg sine theta component pulling down the ramp. Same thing. All right, so that's this side, r mg sine theta. Let's work on this side. We need the moment of inertia around that point. So we need the parallel axis theorem, right? Because we're not going through the center of mass. We're going through a, an axis parallel to the axis to the center of mass. So let's see, that would be i to the center of mass, the moment to the center of mass, um, plus mr squared because the distance to the other axis is r, so that's r squared, and it's all the mass. We put all the mass at that distance. And then that's alpha times alpha that we're looking for. Let's see. So well, let's forget the vector notation starting here. Uh, let's see. So now, what can we do? We could go ahead and plug in for this, the moment around the center mass for the disk, 1 half m r squared. That's for a solid cylinder. Plus m r squared 
And then we got to think, what do we really want here? Let's, let's actually, instead of rotational values, let's see how fast it's going. I want to solve for the acceleration of the center of mass, because that's going to let us convert this alpha here to the, uh, the acceleration of the center of the mass. Because right? we know that if it rolls without slipping, that those are related by the radius. Right? So one turn of this is a rotational change, but since we know the circumference, it translates to a translational change. So there's that relationship between the arc length and the distance, the velocity and the angular velocity, and the acceleration and the angular acceleration. And there it is right there. Alpha is a, uh, the acceleration of the center of mass over r. And I've dropped the vector notation. Let's see, it's rolling. It's probably into the board. OK, that sounds fine. Why don't we now notice uh, something interesting? If we solve for a, let's start solving for a. Let's get rid of that and put a square there. And notice now mr squared is in every term. Right? So if I want to solve this for the acceleration of the center mass, what would I have left? I would have g sine theta right, over what's left here? 1 half plus 1. Right? I mean, so all a moment of inertia is is mr squared uh, with some constants in front of it. So all that's left is 3 halves. So what we get is this thing will accelerate at 2 thirds g sine theta. So what's kind of remarkable about that is it doesn't depend on the mass or the radius of the cylinder. It's basically saying all cylinders, no matter how big they are and how heavy they are, will have the same acceleration down the ramp, which sounds kind of weird. Maybe we should see if that's true or not. All right. So what I've got here is three cylinders, different sizes and different masses because they're made out of different materials. This one is really heavy. I'm pretty sure it's steel. It looks like it's made out of iron. This one is solid, except for a teeny hole in the middle. It's shiny and light, probably aluminum. This is probably also steel, but it's at least a different size, right? Three cylinders. What we're going to do is let them roll down the ramp, and I'm going to start them exactly together, and we'll see if they have the same acceleration of their center of mass. Let's see. Here we go. Sure enough, you heard them all hit. They all fell off the ramp at exactly the same time. Amazing. Now, is this only true for a cylinder? No, right? Because if we think about it, this whole derivation, the only place that the cylinder properties show up is here. This is the moment of the center of mass plus mr squared here in the parallel axis theorem. So if we wanted to do a, an empty uh, cylinder, like a cylindrical shell, right? So that would just be this case. All the mass sits at the radius r. So what that says is that this becomes mr squared. Right? So mr squared plus mr squared is 2 mr squared. This becomes 2 uh, instead of 3 halves. So it's basically just a half uh, g sine theta. Yeah, half g sine theta. So we can confirm that. We can look at a couple of empty cylinders here, different sizes. I think they're both aluminum, but they are different sizes. So is it true for every shape? Or is it just true for a solid cylinder? Let's find out. Mm, and go, and boom. Exactly the same. Hit it exactly the same time. They just accelerated a little slower, 1 half g sine theta. I have three spheres here. We have to know, right? We have to know. So here's three spheres. They're all solid spheres. Uh, this is rubber, this is rubber, this feels harder, probably Bakelite or something like that. And, uh, and we know for a sphere, two-fifths goes here. And again, all you're going to have is a constant down here, two-fifths plus one. This should go down at five-sevenths g sine theta. And let's see if they all go down the same. Surely they will. This will be less of a noisy crash, but more fun to watch. And... Boom. Exactly the same. You can even uh, use this kind of a, a, a calculation to figure out who's going to go down the fastest. So I think my last two here, yes, my last two are uh, a cylinder, a, a cylindrical shell, 
in a solid sphere. And we can just plug in here and see what's going to happen. Cylindrical shell, we already talked about. This would be 1 plus 1 is 2, so it's 1 half g sine theta. And the uh, sphere, we said, was uh, 2 fifths, so 2 fifths says uh, 7 fifths, so flip it over 5 sevenths g sine theta. So you can see the sphere should go faster, right? So let's see. Completely different materials. Aluminum, cylindrical shell, rubber ball. Bigger shell than a ball, it doesn't matter. The sphere has to win. Here we go. And the sphere wins. There you go. Newton's law, never wrong.